welcome to you all um, and as, on this, to this webinar. My name is Anthony Boggs. Um, I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown uh, University. Uh, this webinar is uh, part of a workshop um, in which we have a group of scholars from Europe, the Caribbean, United States, Brazil, and Africa who are meeting to discuss and try and work through, uh, you know, what some people call an ambitious project to think about uh, race, slavery, capitalism, and colonialism and, and the making of the modern world, the relationship of all these, uh, both concepts and social practices and social systems and how they made the modern world. Um, this particular project is, uh, um, hosted by or convened by the uh, CSSJ, Center for the, Study of Race, Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice at Brown, as well as the Research Center for Material uh, Culture in Leiden, Amsterdam, and the International Institute of Social History um, in, uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, in the webinar, uh, we will have, uh, we have three really very important and quite frankly um, amazing uh, uh, thinkers and historians who are going to speak um, to this particular subject. They will speak anywhere between 15 and uh, 20 minutes. And then um, we will open up for Q&A uh, um, for about an hour. And, and, and Catherine, um, uh, who works with the center, um, will lead that, will lead that particular uh, process. Let me just introduce the speakers. Um, in the order in, in which uh, in the order in which they will speak, and and and, and get this uh, get the show on the road, so to speak. Um, uh, Jennifer Morgan is uh, is, a his, is a professor of history in the Department of uh, Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU, New York University, where she serves as the chair. She's the author of *Laboring Women: Gender*. And reproduction in the making of the new world, and the co-editor of Connections: uh, Histories of Race and Sex in America, published in 2018. Her research examines the intersections of race and gender in the Black Atlantic world. Um, and in addition to her work as a historian, Jennifer, Jennifer has published a wide range of essays on race, gender, and the processes of doing history. Most notably. Uh, experiencing Black feminism in that, real, in that very important anthology of, edited by Deborah White, uh, telling histories of Black women historians in the, uh, in the ivory tower. She's, uh, she's, she's now proof reading the proofs of her book for, of her, for her next book, which I'm sure uh, talk, you know, which I'm sure she will um, talk about, uh, about a bit. So welcome Jennifer and thank you very much for agreeing to do this. Uh, Walter Johnson um, is the Winthrop Professor of History and Professor of African American Studies at Harvard University. Uh, he grew up in Columbia, Missouri, is a member of the Rock Bridge um, High School Hall of Fame. I think that's very important to Walter. Um, his prize winning, uh, his prize winning books, Soul by Soul, um, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, as well as the River of Dark Dream Slavery and Empire in the Mississippi Valley. Cotton Kingdom were published by Harvard University Press. His uh, autobiographical essay, Guns in the Family, um, was included in the 2019 of American, of a edition of Amer Best American Essays. And um, he's, I mean, Reese, he told us this morning that his book, The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States, so it's just been, uh, has just been published. Johnson Walter is a founding member of the Commonwealth Project, which brings together academics, artists, and activists in an effort to imagine, foster, and support revolutionary social change uh, beginning in, uh, in, in, uh, in St. Louis. Our final speaker is Dr. Pepin, uh, Professor Pepin Brandon, who is a professor at the uh, Free University of Amsterdam. Um, and is, who is a historian, um, at, 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 sorry, and also uh, a senior researcher at the International Institute of Social History. 
his work focuses on history of capitalism, war, and economic development and slavery. He uh, obtained his master's in uh, history at the University of Amsterdam, as well as his PhD at the University of Amsterdam. Um, and his book, which is uh, really something, a book that I would recommend to many folks called War, Capital, and the Dutch State, uh, 1588 to 1795, is um, really an important uh, text. Uh, Professor Brandon has worked at the University of Pittsburgh as a NWO and Rubicon Fellowship. And in the, um, in the 2000 and spring of 2020, he was an Erasmus lecturer on the history of civilization of Netherlands and Flanders. And he's also a visiting, a visiting, uh, visiting scholar here at the CSSJ and the co-convener um, of the project on race, slavery. Uh, colonialism and capitalism. These are the speakers. I don't want to take up time, um, but it isn't in the preamble, but just really to, as I said, to welcome you all to introduce the uh, speakers. And the running order would be um, Professor Morgan, Professor Johnson, and then Professor Brandon. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you uh, to Professor Bogues for, for convening us. Um, thank you to the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and to the International Institute for Social History. Um, I uh, am going to, um, I'm going to, I have a, probably a slightly shorter than 20 minutes uh, talk uh, where I want to talk through what the compelling areas of inquiry um, around race, slavery, colonialism, and capitalism are uh, for me um, and in my work. So this is really more of an opportunity for me to kind of um, to talk through some of the things that I think are really crucial as we move forward, both uh, those of us in the workshop, as well as um, the many um, scholars and students who I know are uh, convened to watch us. So for me, the compelling areas of inquiry um, can be condensed into three kind of overarching concerns. And the first is the most simple, and that really has to do with periodization. Um, in my own work, I have been compelled to attend more specifically and more kind of carefully um, to the 16th and the early 17th century as key um, and as formative uh, in, the, in the formation of the Black Atlantic world. Um, and until recently, I think, uh, relatively under-examined areas uh, by scholars of slavery, especially those of us who um, approach slavery and the Atlantic from a North American framework. Um, I think that, I mean, there's a huge, obviously there's a huge amount of scholarship on, on early modern, on the early modern Atlantic. Um, but I think that those of us who come to the Atlantic um, as scholars of slavery are more, we've, you know, there's, there's more of us in the 19th century and the 18th century rather than in the early period. And I think that that's, uh, I think that, that there are really important questions to be answered uh, by looking at the 17th and the 16th century. Um, and, and those that, that should be foundational to the work um, that we in this uh, working group are moving forward to think about. Um, I think that those of us who work on the English Atlantic um, need to engage much more seriously with Iberia um, and how the Iberian conquest um, uh, shaped later English um, and Dutch uh, and French uh, ventures. And I think that we need to engage the late 18th and 19th century scholars of capitalism. Uh, I've often thought of my own work as sort of adding like a preamble to the really important work of my colleagues who are focused on slavery in the antebellum period or the late 18th century. Um, but I think that there are questions that we need to be asking each other across the timeframes um, of these centuries. So that's that feels to me like a, a fairly easy provocation, um, but I think that it has it it could yield some really important results. Um, my second uh, compelling area of inquiry has to do with the intersection between race 
and economics as key formations, uh, both uh, formations in the histories of ideology um, that in turn have produced the subject areas into which our work falls. Um, drawing on Michel Rolf Trio's notion of the unthinkable, um, I'm increasingly committed to dismantling, maybe in small ways, maybe in bigger ways, uh, the ways in which the categories of inquiry that shape our work as historians of race, of culture, or of economy um, have positioned those areas as distinct. Um, much of the copious scholarship that's devoted to, for example, the problem that um, newly encountered populations on the African continent um, and in the Americas posed for early settlers and slave owners um, has been devoted to clarifying the emergence of race um, as an ideological stance that responds to the problem of slavery. Um, what I want to think about um, is that slavery as an economic practice and race as an ideological conviction emerge simultaneously in a field of meaning that propelled early modern modern capitalism in ways that were crucial and brutal, um, but that also have produced areas of um, knowledge formation, of historical inquiry that, that re-amplify the work of segregating race and economy so that um, those of us who work on social formation or those of us who work on histories of economic thought um, or those of us who work on questions of culture tend to approach these things um, as siloed uh, in ways that, um, you know, my, my own thinking on this is, is deeply um, uh, influenced by Sylvia Winter's uh, interventions about the ways in which enlightenment thought are, are, um, are inseparable uh, from the crisis of, of European contact with the Americas um, and, and, the, and have, um, and have results that we are still in the process of dismantling. Um, so if we're charting the development of conceptual vocabularies of race, for example, that, um, that, that worked to place native or African populations um, in ways that are, uh, that are useful for those early European settlers, um, ways that articulate race and racial difference um, as, foundational to trade, um, as foundational to the conceptual categories of what is logical and what is illogical, um, that, that connection feels um, to me to be foundational. Uh, that if we overlook the connection between race and the idea of what is rational, um, in these foundational moments, we're ill-equipped to comprehend uh, the, the kind of powerful sway um, that the claim to irrational behavior or irrational thought has on the rational economics that follow. And I apologize if that's a little too convoluted and I'm happy to open that up a little bit more um, in questions. So finally, um, Third and finally, I want to think more carefully, obviously, uh, about the connection between gender and slavery. Um, in, a, in a short article that was published in Small Acts recently, I've, I've revisited the case of Elizabeth Key, uh, the woman in the Virginia colony um, who sued for recognition of her freedom as the child of an, a free English man and an enslaved African woman. Um, and this is a suit that led to the 1662 Act um, that declared that children conceived by Englishmen with African women would follow the condition of the mother. Um, it's it's a, an act that most scholars of slavery are very intimately connect, you know, aware of. Um, it is a crucial, if by 1662, a somewhat symbolic moment in the law in that it moved children from the household um, and placed them on ledger sheets. Um, it's, a, it's a way in which the English are rationalizing uh, their elimination of African women's progeny from the population right, from the category of population um, by instituting an overriding understanding of them as products, 
as th these children are, are commerce, they are products. Uh, we understand this, right? And yet I think we need a lot more clarity about the repositioning of white men's offspring from the category of kin to the category of inventory. Um, something far more than simply an abstraction or an abstracted idea of race was at play uh, for enslaved women on the English colonial frontier. As they were systematically being assigned value as commodities, their capacity to situate their children as kin was being stripped away. And that, that process, I argue, is something that those women were, were um, profoundly aware of. Uh, the presence of women uh, like Elizabeth Key in the courts um, testifies to their prescience, their understanding um, that enslavement, race, Hereditary, heredity and kinship were amalgamating um, in ways that boded very badly for them and for their children. And this is the piece that um, as a social historian of, of women, of enslaved women, um, African and women of African descent in the English Atlantic world, I feel that a focus on those women's lives helps us to understand some of these moments in which ideas of race and ideas of economy are interwoven. And that through the lives of women like Elizabeth Key, we can understand something very materially tangible about the connection between race, slavery, and the origin of modern capitalism. Um, the enactment of, uh, of, of, of that legal shift that the, 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 the substitution of, um, of those children from into inventory from households um, undergirds uh, the relationship between hereditary racial slavery and Atlantic modernity. Um, the story of the early modern slave trade and the story of racial formation in the Atlantic world is not simply a, you know, a story about how uh, Africans get moved from like the category of the savage to the category of the slave to the category of, of black, of, of, of of racially marked. Um, if, we, if we just think about that as the process, uh, we divorce the making of blackness, like the, the, the tangibility of racial formation um, from the world in which population, numeracy, demography, the credit economy, and all of those things are interwoven. Um, Africans were not immediately rendered as savage. They were not immediately moved to the category of enslavable and finally marked as racially distanced and then condemned. Um, historians of the Iberian Atlantic have done a lot to disrupt this kind of singular arc that somehow there's only the history of slavery that we need to contend with. Um, and my supposition, again, through a woman like Elizabeth Key is to see how she understands a process unfolding, but it's not a process that has already happened to her. Um, the intellectual and the discursive tools that white Englishmen use to move Africans into the category of enslavable um, and enslaved is, uh, is still opaque, um, but it's a, it's a process that I think we see um, a little more clearly if we focus on the lives of these women who are either symbolically or actually producing um, matter of inventory for slave owners. So I have one um, kind of final thing before uh, to wrap up. Um, uh, economic historian Carl Winterland um, concluded his study of 17th century English credit, which is called Casualties of Credit, uh, with a focus on the willingness, the sort of surprising willingness of English finance ministers, investors, and propagandists um, to simply ignore the human dimensions of the slave trade um, in favor of investing in the South Sea Company. Um, the South Sea Company relied on the public favorably imagining the prospects of the Atlantic slave trade as something that they could um, invest a small amount of money in and reap some returns. The, the slave trade is an abstraction to the early um, uh, investors of um, uh, the early investors in the South Sea Company. Um, for the company's shareholders, he argues, uh, mobilizing 
the imagination that the slave trade was somehow, you know, financially neutral um, was crucial in the context of an, the expanding role of an investing public, um, a group of citizens who had a, who were sort of middle middling folks who had a little bit of money and were interested in watching that money grow. Um, even though the South Sea Company ultimately failed quite spectacularly uh, during its first years, public confidence in the, in the slave trade as a means of addressing the nation's financial crisis was strong enough to repeatedly inflate the share prices of the South Sea Company. So for those of you who know about the bursting the South Sea bubble, one of the reasons is that the prices were inflated um, well beyond their ability to reap those returns. Um, what was inflated then was a sense that the slave trade and England's ability to capture the, the, the wealth that would accrue to them through the slave trade was seen as a logical and reasonable investment for the vast majority of, um, of English shareholders. The widespread ability to ignore the mortality of slaves um, to ignore the, the violence that was being done to enslaved Africans, to ignore the possibility of slave rebellions or revolt aboard ships, strikes Winterland as a core component of what he calls credit fetishism, okay? The power of credit's general capacity to obfuscate its underlying social reality. Um, for me, that metaphor of credit fetishism is, is so, perfectly captures uh, the work that I want us to think carefully about in this, um, in this working group, which is the ways in which the um, claim to logic and investment and value, sort of transparent ideas of value um, are underpinned by a racial imaginary in which Africans and the slave trade has already been reduced to a matter of calculus. By the end of the 17th century, the link between the promise of Atlantic wealth and the economic health of the English nation was seamlessly made through the silenced bodies of African men, women, and children. Um, I think that the fetish of, of credit was joined to another phantasmogram, um, another phantasmagorical manner of thinking, um, the degree to which racialist logics were mobilized to transform violence into rationality, into the rationality of financial instruments and the fiscal health of a kingdom in Europe suggests that race and capitalism were caught in circuits of reinscribing each other from the very beginning. And I think that's the key question for me is how does the logic of race and capitalism underpin all of these moments um, like the moment in 1662 when the Virginia House of Burgesses says, you know, in this case, in the case of Englishmen having sex with raping African women, those children are not there progeny, they are their property. It's a, it's a, it's a breathtaking um, example, I think, of the way that the logic of capital um, inter, interrupts uh, the logic of kinship, the logic of, um, of, of recognition um, of what's at stake uh, in, in the making of, of hereditary racial slavery. So the degree to which to end, the degree to which hereditary racial slavery authorized conceptual notions of what was marketable, what was rational and what was moral um, and how colonial markets should or could rationally function, I think remains a provocation in the history of the Atlantic world and one that I hope um, we can talk about here. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Johnson, Walter. Yeah, I'd like to um, begin by thanking Tony Bogues and Pep and Brandon for including me in this project. Um, and to um, emphasize to everyone that Jennifer Morgan's forthcoming book, Reckoning with Slavery, is now available for pre order. So I think it's going to be um, a, a real landmark for us, and I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, um, you know, I, I was promised a trip to Amsterdam, and now I find myself in my kitchen. And I was told that I was speaking to a workshop, and now I see that there are 365 people listening. And so I'm a little bit, um, I'm, not, I'm, not at my, I'm not at my best here. Um, 
but I do, uh, I do want to begin by, by taking for granted something. And I want to take for granted that we're having a conversation in which we agree that we might want to use the term racial capitalism to discuss the history of slavery and really the history of the relationship between Europe, the Americas, and Africa after 1492. Um, and, and in the question period, we could go back and revisit why we might want to do that. But what, what I really want to do is to try to, to look forward um, to things that I think that if we are going to do that, um, we need to, we need to um, think more about, you know, what, what are the, the sort of horizons where we need to, to think more. Um, the first horizon, I think, is is really to, for me, is really to echo a lot of what Jennifer just said, or, or I guess not echo because I can't do it in as much detail or as with what, as much intellectual precision, but to gesture towards it. Um, that we need to think very hard about the relationship of racial capitalism to gender sexuality and, and reproduction. If we are thinking about the reproduction over time of economic systems and systems of racial domination, we are thinking always already about reproduction, about the management of reproduction and the categorization, um, the intellectual and, and physical violent control of, of reproduction. And I think that's obvious um, to everyone who has read Deborah Gray White's work or Jennifer's work or Marissa Fuentes or Jessica Marie Johnson, Dana Ramey Berry, a lot, a lot of this work. And a lot of that work um, does treat capitalism as a, a um, central category. And so I do think that, that the history of racial capitalism is a history of um, by a lot of, of the control of, of reproductive invigilation and um, natal alienation. Um, I think that also we need to think about that in a, um, in a complicated way over, over history about the different ways that populations, people are um, racialized and um, the different sorts of sexual control that that um, involves. And so in my own work, um, on the history of the South and, and more recently on the history of St. Louis, it, it's important to think about the fact that, um, <clears throat> and this is really to, to, to follow Patrick Wolf, that um, slavery in the United States was pro-natalist. It was very much focused on, well, not very much focused, but there was a focus on the reproduction of the enslaved population over time, on the control of enslaved women's um, reproduction. There was a great deal of focus on the control of enslaved women's reproduction and a slightly more, uh, a slightly less focused control on the reproduction of the population over time, by which I mean that many children were allowed to die. Um, the relationship of the very same slaveholding um, imperialists to native women and native reproduction was vastly different. Um, that the, the dominant um, white supremacist settler colonialist idea about um, native people was simply that they should disappear. And so there was a genocidal rather than a pro-natalist approach. And so I think it's as we go through and, and try to think with a little bit more historical precision about the history of racial capitalism in North America or elsewhere, we need to, to think about the different sorts of, of um, implications um, for the control of reproduction and for, um, for the, the, the people um, who are being colonized and enslaved. Um, I think there's also a way then that we would want to think outwards about how it is that we are going to, if, if we employ racial capitalism as one of our central un categories for understanding, how is it that we're going to deal with, um, with the kind of heteronormativity of these societies, right? How does one begin to, to try to um, reach beyond the kind of limits of our um, of our histories in the way that, that Jennifer was suggesting to to engage the um, 
to engage queer studies in a, in a much more, um, I think, uh, both forthright and open, open manner. Um, the second thing that I, I want to talk about is, I guess I, I've already talked about it in a way, which is that I think we need to th begin to try to think about the relationship of, of histories of racial capitalism to histories that are done under the rubric of settler colonialism or imperialism, which is to say that we need to, to think much more concertedly about empire and genocide and about the, um, the world beyond the relationship, um, you know, the crucially important, um, relationship of, of Europe and Africa. We need to, to think about the indigenous populations of, of North America, South America, um, and, and Africa to Africa and Europe to, to, to for that matter. Um, and to think about these again as intimately related but not identical processes. Um, I think that, that uh, Cedric Robinson writes in Black Marxism that uh, about the related exploitations and oppressions of African, European, Asian, and Amerindian people that have been covered over with the myth of white solidarity and superiority. And so to try and think very concertedly about those relations, about the removal of the, um, the, the five so-called five civilized tribes from the South um, at the at the foundation of the cotton kingdom, and um, and I think about the implications for our own narratives of um, resistance and emancipation. I think that if we begin to take um, seriously the settler colonialist critique of um, the dominant historiography of the United States, virtually all of our categories are going to need to be profoundly reworked, and I think that's both a daunting and extremely exciting. Um, intellectual and political possibility. Um, we talked a little bit this morning about the fact that these sorts of social relations are always spatial relations and because they're always spatial relations, they're always also ecological relations. They have to do with the control of resources and the expenditure of industry, uh, of, of energy. <clears throat> Again, um, there are fantastic examples of how we might go about thinking about this. Catherine McKittrick's Demonic Ground, Clyde Woods' Development Arrested um, are the two that I have read uh, most recently. Um, and I think that we need to think about the relationship, um, I've argued elsewhere, about the instrumentalization of human beings to the instrumentalization of, of nature. Um, and, but also to think about the way that different kinds of formations of, of racial capitalism and, and empire have different kinds of, of both eco ecological and human consequences. And um, to think about the, the perhaps um, baleful uh, affinity of, I, I really apologize for the phone, I'm not in control of the phone. Um, uh, the baleful affinity of um, extractive industry and genocide. Um, W.B. Du Bois in a passage in um, The World in Africa, I think does an um, extraordinary job. And maybe when I finish talking, I'll try to post that in the chat if everybody will be able to see that of trying to make this point through an image of the ivory billiard balls and piano keys in a parlor in London um, and relating that to the human and um, animal uh, costs, ecological costs of imperialism in, in Africa. Um, I think that it's important, and, and this, is, this is, is, is to think about the relationship of economic exploitation and racial domination over time as being malleable. And so to try to, to get beyond the idea that, that we're simply trying to think about a relationship between economic exploitation and racial derogation. Um, we are certainly trying to think about that, but, but that um, both racism and capitalism are much more devilishly complicated than that. 
And so to think about um, both uh, racism that is in excess of economic exploitation, I, um, I mean, I, I think that we could probably argue that the, the attack on the Capitol was, was an example of racism that was in excess of economic um, exploitation. And I, I think that a lot of the commentary on the left of, of trying to, to point out various moments at which a, a argument that faces, you know, focuses solely on the quote, economic insecurity of um, nativist or white supremacist um, actors in the United States is insufficient to understanding the reach and vigor of their, um, of their project. I think also though we need to think about um, class rule and class power about economic class as operating in excess of racial governance. Um, I think that, you know, I, I think one of the things that we would need to do is, is to think about the way that tools, this is something that, that I think that, that Kesu Park has done wonderfully, that I tried to, to echo in the book that I just finished about St. Louis, that tools that are pioneered and um, justified as tools to control um, uh, people who are labeled as different, whether it's native people or Africans or African Americans or, or immigrants or, or queers or women or, are um, often then generalized to the control of the population at large. And I think that that's a way that we might think about both the, um, the violence in our society, particularly the police violence, the state violence as being um, justified as um, controlling um, different sorts of marginalized populations, but being then being employed against the population at large, although obviously unevenly. Um, and I think that's a way that we might think about the social abandonment um, of, of large um, portions of our population. Again, something that is, is pioneered and justified as a social abandonment of particular stigmatized classes or groups, but then is gradually um, generalized to the population at large. Um, it's also, I think, important as we go forward to think about um, class relationships within, say, um, African America. Um, finally, and th this is, you know, this is a little bit looser, but I, I do think that we need to, to attend to and really think about what, um, what Cedric Robinson calls the ontological totality by which he, he means a revolutionary consciousness that proceeds from the whole historical experience of black people and not merely from the social formations of capitalist slavery and the relationships of production of colonization or of, I think he says colonization, my handwriting is quite poor. Um, and I think in, in a way that's, that's to gesture at trying to write, and, and I, I heard this in, in a lot of what, what Jennifer was saying as well, of, of trying to write histories that go beyond the resistance paradigm, of trying to attend to all of the dimensions that, of, of um, enslaved humanity or of colonized humanity. Um, and, and, you know, ask, aspects of that it would be the ecological thinking of enslaved people or their thinking about animal rights or their ethic of care. Or Jennifer was talking, I think, quite powerfully about, about motherhood, indeed about, about childhood or, or, or fatherhood as, as one, of, one of our students here is doing, or about love, laughter, suffering, and flourishing, all of those, those dimensions of of history and human experience that stretch beyond simply trying to, to write a kind of a dia, what, what Robinson would call a dialectical negation of, of the history of Europe. And I, I think that does then go back to what, what Jennifer talked about at the, at the very end, which is that finally what we need to do is to recognize that a lot of our categories of understanding, the ways that we, we organize and um, execute the, the pursuit of knowledge um, are in fact um, structured in dominance. They are, um, they proceed directly from this history. And so to try to, to think from the, the 
the bottom of the slave ship in a way to 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 destroy the the categories of understanding that emerged on the deck. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Walter. Pepe. My thanks to Tony for your introduction and to the uh, Center uh, for the Study of Slavery and Justice for launching this initiative and for choosing the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam as a partner to engage in this, I think, extremely challenging and, and uh, um, uh, very sort of um, uh, uh, very important, uh, important project. And also thanks to Tony for uh, pushing me onto this platform with uh, uh, other speakers uh, from, whom, from, from whose work I've learned so much um, over time. Uh, and I'll try to follow up on your very profound um, uh, comments and, uh, and, and say something um, about how my own research fits into this and how sort of the, the intense debate over slavery in a very different context from the United States, namely the Netherlands actually connects uh, resonate to, uh, uh, with a lot of what you have, uh, have said be, uh, before. So uh, to, to, to first say that I don't think it would uh, have been possible for this, um, uh, this forum to attract such attention and so many participants if there wasn't, if people didn't feel there, there is an immediate political relevance to debating these historical issues. And of course, I don't have to say anything about sort of the um, immediate political relevance in the context of the United States for, from which I, I guess many of you are, are watching this. But I wanted to say something about the context of the Netherlands where three hours ago, actually the Dutch government resigned over a huge scandal where the uh, Dutch equivalent of the IRS um, marked thousands of uh, citizens as potential um, uh, tax uh, uh, evaders and without a shred of evidence demanded thousands of euro euros uh, uh, bankrupting many actually in the process from poor people in the Netherlands uh, in a hunt for potential uh, uh, potential fraudsters that uh, was uh, from the outset guided by a form of racial profiling. Now interestingly enough the government fell over this but in the uh, preceding investigation, it stipulated that discrimination or uh, racial dis discrimination or racial profiling would not be part of the investigation of the government um, of the government's action. So this resignation is the most immediate uh, context, but it also is in a country that um, over the last year has seen various attempts to to reckon with the history of uh, of slavery. Uh, um, among others, the initiatives from the city of Amsterdam and Rotterdam to move towards formal apologies for their historic role in uh, slavery in the Amsterdam case where uh, I was involved in their preceding, uh, preceding research. And that is, I think, a very important uh, development. It was certainly accelerated by Black Lives Matter, but it did not originate with Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter. It has been a, a process of, ten, uh, of at least 10 years of, uh, of challenging the status quo on, in this, uh, in, in this rega re regard. But it also begs the question, how valuable sort of such apologies for, um, for a historical act uh, actually um, uh, are if sort of present forms of racism are so blatantly ignored or not, not seen as part of the, uh, of the, uh, of, of the equation. Um, now, this happens also in a context, and so there we can move from the, the politics of the moment to the uh, politics of history or the historiography, where for a very long time, slavery was deemed completely irrelevant for the history of the nation. And it was deemed irrelevant for the history of the Netherlands on a, on a series of grounds. One was the emphasis of trade over empire. So the Dutch expansion in the Atlantic world famously has been described as expansion without empire, even though the Dutch held uh, colonies. But it, the idea is that trade was the, 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 uh, was the binding logic to, uh, to this, um, which means that this is the history 
um, of the free markets and hardly the history of the state, right, and state power, um, and uh, which also has been driven by the assumption that the ideas underpinning expansion in the uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th century were wholly pragmatic. They were sort of basically a set of accounting logics where rational choices were made over what was more profitable. And because it was pragmatic, then ideology uh, and certainly race did not play a role. And um, uh, where in the mainstream histori historiography of the Netherlands, therefore, um, it can, cannot be said that, that the approach is that the Netherlands is uh, post-race, but actually race never was an operative aspect of how this form of colonial domination, expansion, and uh, engagement with slavery worked. Now, Gloria Wecker has written an important book, Dutch, uh, uh, White Innocence, on how, how this works in the present, this, the, the, the making of this kind of, uh, uh, of historiography. But I want to go a bit deeper into sort of what it means for our understanding of the, the past and what challenging this means for our understanding of the um, of the nation uh, past. And the reason why I think this is important is that although, of course, there are national peculiarities to the construction of this notion of how Dutch expansion in particular works, I think in some ways the Dutch case here is archetypical for the discussion uh, on the relationship between capitalism and slavery uh, more, uh, more generally, where many economic historians would actually say slavery is unimportant to the history of capitalism precisely for those reasons, for uh, precisely for, uh, um, uh, for uh, the uh, notion that trade dominates empire, that, that uh, the free market was more important than the state and state, uh, and state power, and that capitalism is inherently a pragmatic system, and that therefore any sort of form of, sort of structural violence or, uh, uh, or oppressive ideology must be some sort of potential outgrowth, an uh, 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 un unhappy outgrowth, I should say, of the system. Now, these logics are being uh, challenged now in, in Dutch historiography, as well as they are um, as they are elsewhere. Um, and I would say that is this is crucial for a sort of a rebirth that we're seeing in critical historiography. And the rebirth aspect here is very important because, of course, these strands of a counter narrative have been very, very present always and also within, within the Netherlands and certainly within its empire. And also um, uh, uh, it draws a lot on sort of critical thinking that has been going on um, uh, internationally on these, uh, on these uh, subjects. Um, uh, but this rebirth, I would say, still uh, um, maintains the separation. So we, in fact, we have two areas in which there is a big shift. One is in trying to connect the uh, the history of Dutch capitalism to uh, uh, to slavery, and the other is to understand uh, the Dutch involvement in uh, slavery as crucially implicated with the question of race as well. But as I would say in many other cases, how these two actually fit together that is a very very uh, difficult question, um, uh, and there's not yet I think sufficient concrete research. Into how how to approach uh, how how to approach, but there are major shifts in terms of the sort of our understanding. First of all, of, of the history of capitalism and um, and 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 slavery, where um, the dominant attitude has been a form of national um, accounting um, that that followed a once again a logic that I think has been particularly strong in debates on the English case. As, um, uh, as well, and the template is rather simple. So these nations are related through slavery, their national accounts at least, are related to slavery through trade, right? That is how slavery contributes practically to GDP. And being a sector of trade, the percentage that you come to, if you calculate, will be around 5%, 6%. Uh, 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 6%. That can be completely sort of, um, uh, which is completely logical, but it sounds as very little. Then the second step is to say, okay, this was a small amount because it was five or six percent, um, uh, um, and um, um, and then to come up with a counterfactual, 
um, and say, okay, if these five percent would not have been invested in slavery, capitalism would probably have flourished uh, still. And then the third move, and I think this third move is crucial in these debates, is to say uh, is to then treat the counterfactual as somehow more real than the real history in which there was widespread economic involvement in um, uh, in uh, in slavery. Now we've been trying to challenge this by recalculating the sort of the importance of slavery on the Dutch uh, account, but actually more fundamentally to try and understand okay where then does that sit? Because we come at a we, in this enterprise we came at an importance of about five percent of the Dutch economy um, being dependent on slavery in uh, around 1770, but explained that this was maybe five percent of the Dutch economy as a whole, but more than ten percent of its most dynamic and wealthy problem. Uh, 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 Holland, um, um, uh, 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 over 25 percent of all goods that came into, or around 25 percent of all goods that gave, came into uh, Dutch harbors and exited Dutch harbors with distressing value were produced by slave labor on Atlantic plantations, and about 40 percent of economic growth between the 1730s and the se late 1770s in the province of Holland actually came from this expansive. Uh, expensive sector. In other words, it's not just about sort of understanding this in terms of the uh, uh, of the national account. Actually, this is much more a question of political economy, or understanding where uh, um, uh, a certain sector of trade fits into the making of capitalism in a more systemic uh, uh, systemic sense. Now, um, um, second, the second shift in histori historiography is in not treating slavery merely as a branch of the national economy, but also treating it, as many have done elsewhere, as a system of domination, understanding why power then is central to this, and then understanding how this relates to notions of race and uh, racialization. Now, and I want to emphasize here that this, of course, is, is th th there is a crucial link between race racialization and Atlantic uh, slavery. But in many ways, the Dutch case invites us to situate this linkage in, in, within the wider world. Uh, uh, in the Dutch case, it's so, so particularly glaring because its expansion from the outset was an expansion both in the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean, uh, Indian Ocean uh, era, area that also included massive slavery next to many other forms of colonial, uh, uh, colonial um, uh, uh, domination. Now, interestingly enough, um, in the Dutch case, we see the Dutch uh, um, actually bor borrowing this Portuguese practice of treating black and slave as interchangeable terms for the first time systematically, not in the Atlantic world, but in the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, Indian Ocean region. And I could give uh, many examples of this, but one of the infamous Jan Peterson Kuhn, the, the committer of ge genocide on the Banda Islands, already in 1614, so before the Banda genocide, uh, saying that the lack of power of the company in the northern Malacca uh, is because there was an insufficient amount of blacks imported in this uh, uh, in this region. Using this word, uh, uh, blacks, when actually meaning states from a variety of regions, including Eastern Africa and the different zones of uh, of Asia. Or in 1621, uh, 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 proposing to set up a large-scale slave trade in once again saying in black from the Malabar coast and and, uh, and Goa. Now this is not to say that that sort of this expansion involves the creation of some sort of homogeneous racial um, ideology, um, or that uh, in fact that such a homogeneous racial ideology ever emerged because it might be um, a granting sort of Racist too much to even assume that there is some sort of a coherent sort of uh, a global uh, ideology here, but to say that the elements of racism were drawn from the wider uh, 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 the wider context, even though sort of uh, African slavery in the Atlantic world played a crucial role in shaping its um, formulation. Now, how do these things fit together? Uh, that is a very uh, <laughs> difficult question, of course, and I think, think sort of. Um, it requires both uh, rigorous theoretical thinking and um, uh, and concrete ways to make this concrete in terms of research programs. And I think that sort of both the remarks of Jennifer Morgan and Walter Johnson before me sketched 
a lot of ways in which this can do uh, can be done concretely, and the elements that we have to take into account. Now, I would only sort of uh, say about this, and as, that as a final remark, that I think this is very fruitful, fruitful uh, terrain for further investigations. Investigations. That I think that there is a certain strand of orthodox Marxism that has the problem of trying to reach all these forms of oppression immediately from the logic of individual capital and its reproduction. And then I think there is a sort of that there is a fundamental mistake there that um, um, uh, and for, for, for me sort of this question somehow begins with the transformation from societies with capital, which existed in many different places in the world, not only Europe by, uh, by the way, from societies with capital to capitalist society. And once capital sort of uh, becomes a dominant factor in, in sort of in setting the logic of social reproduction for at, the, at this systemic scale, and once it does so partly through the power of the state, I think there's always the need for underlying ordering uh, 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 principles or forms of subjection that go beyond the purely uh, economic and that fuse elements of international power projection it, uh, 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 which means the state in imperial form, the two forms of class domination and labor controls, and forms of biopolitics control over the social reproduction of life, of land, of labor power, uh, and of nature for uh, capital. And the challenge is to understand, to, to link an understanding of the multiplicities of forms in which this of necessity happens when you try to think about this as on the global uh, scale to um, uh, uh, to the, the uh, to an understanding of the, the at the same time with all this diversity sort of the global systemic uh, uh, systemic ways in which this, this came together in the process of uh, European expansion and the Atlantic slavery and I'll I'll leave it at that. All right, great. Uh, thank you very much, Captain. Um, we will now open to the uh, audience for uh, questions. Um, Catherine. Um, can you marshal us through this? Absolutely. The first question came in for Professor Morgan from Marjorie, who asks, I'm wondering to what extent the Inquisition's drop of blood principle and persecution of converts to Christianity fed into the drop of blood and taint of African descent. Has this been studied as you and others are focusing more on Spain's role? Thank you. Uh, that was, that's, it's a really good question. I, I don't, I can't answer the question specifically about the particular ways in which um, the, the inquisitorial practices of, of, of identifying the uh, converts as, as being tainted by one drop connect to an American one drop rule. But what I can point you to is Jim Sweet's 1997 article in the William and Mary Quarterly on the Iberian roots of American racism, in which he um, unfolds a very, very long history um, of, uh, of the sort of intersection between um, uh, prejudicial ideas of, about blackness directed um, both by uh, um, Islamic, uh, and Christian uh, powers in Iberia um, and in North Africa directed towards um, uh, Sub-Saharan Africans um, and the, the kind of way that those ideas are the, are the foundation for um, ideas that are taken up by Northern Europeans as they kind of enter into this conversation. So um, I think that that would be the starting point that I would um, that 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 I would recommend that you take up, but that I know that others have have also done so. Wonderful. The next question is for Walter, and the question is: Is colonial capitalism perhaps a broader concept that might have broader explanatory power than racial capitalism or settler colonialism, as they share some core characteristics? For example, they share the extraction of wealth, labor and land, sacrificing the health and lives of black, native and other racialized communities and broader oppressed groups like queer folks, women and disabled folks. I, I think that's a great question. And I'm, I'm really largely sympathetic to the idea. I think I find myself often using the word um, imperialism as a sort of a, um, undergirding category. Um, 
However, I think the reason that I would stick with racial capitalism and um, in another voice with settler colonialism, um, f at least for the moment, is I think it's extremely important to draw attention to the intellectual genealogies of the project and to insist upon the centrality of the thought of those who have worked in what, what Robinson calls a black radical tradition whether you know then there there are you know complex conversations about about um, what that means, but you know for for me the the thought of of Robinson and Du Bois and um, and Eric Williams and Walter Rodney and Angela Davis and Stephanie Smallwood um, is is really the the pathway that I took into this, and and it's important for me to. Um, it's important to me to keep um, to keep those connections alive. But you know, I, I I have all the sympathy in the world for the for the question. It doesn't seem to me to be a, a um, an inappropriate or um, it seems to me to be an extremely appropriate idea. Wonderful. The next question is for Pepin, and it is: What role did the development of Dutch financial architecture contribute to the worldwide development of colonialism and slavery? Wasn't the Amsterdam stock market the first in the world, and did it spur on Dutch and other countries' colonialism? That's a great question, and I think this is absolutely the case. In the same way that that um, that, of course, the Amsterdam capital market. Uh, built on the uh, the Genoese one that went before it and actually funded many of these earliest Iberian uh, uh, ventures uh, uh, into sort of um, Atlantic uh, uh, exploration, conquest, and enslavement. So, um, uh, so there is a history, it's a, a separate history of. Um, of finance and financial systems uh, um, uh, uh, in this, um, uh, I guess, um, that has many different uh, uh, different uh, different aspects, and I I think um, precisely because of the sort of the nature of international finance and the fact that even sort of Amsterdam at its most sort of dominant moment in this was only one of the sort of the the, the many sort of uh, transition houses for a for a for streams of funds that were always sort of cross cross border. I think finance uh, uh, also helps us, might might help us to think uh, about this question of capitalism and slavery not simply in terms of of, of national uh, uh, national uh, 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 trajectory, right? So um, uh, in the 18th century. Um, uh, partly because of the lack of sort of, sort of uh, very profitable investment opportunities within the Dutch economy, which was then uh, in many of its sectors quite ailing, um, uh, the, the Dutch played a major and driving role in a investment boom in um, in coffee and sugar plantations uh, in the uh, in the Americas, in its own colonies, but but not only in its own colonies. Also, in uh, in, uh, um, in uh, particularly the Danish uh, uh, colonies, the, the Dutch were important funders of the expansion of uh, of U.S. slavery in the American uh, in the American South, partly through loan uh, uh, plantation uh, loans, like the loan that that, uh, that allowed um, Thomas Jefferson uh, to uh, to build his uh, his Monticello plantation. Partly through state loans that uh, that allowed the, um, the, uh, the northern states to acquire uh, uh, much of slave territory in the Louisiana Purchase. So there is this sort of connection, this history of uh, connections of national uh, uh, national economies and their involvement in slavery through international uh, international finance that I think is uh, is very important. There is also the aspect how then ideas about finance investment. And the value of state life travel between uh, settings, and I, I, I really um, uh, uh, thought sort of Professor Morgan's uh, first comment on this, or comment on this in, in her talk, was very, very important. And I, I greatly look forward to her book because I, I think there is um, a, an emergence of an international culture on finance, accounting, etc. 
where you see these practices traveling and you can lay sort of these, these uh, Dutch account books from Suriname next to the ones in the uh, in the um, uh, uh, southern states of the U.S. in the 19th century, and see a sort of a um, perverse refinement of this uh, technique of counting, controlling, and using for greater sort of e efficiency in uh, in profit terms uh, the instruments of the powerful instruments of sort of numbers and 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 the uh, counts and, and of course, sort of the uh, all of that in the end functions to justify sort of uh, um, uh, the uh, the situation on the plantation for sets of investors that were often very far removed from the plantation and set in cities like Amsterdam. The next question comes from Kerry, who uh, the question is about waste. All the panelists mentioned the production of waste, the lives of children and enslaved mothers being wasted despite the need to profit from them. So do the panelists propose we begin to think about waste itself as being the outcome of racialized capitalism? One does not care for one's commodity. How can we think more through this paradox? Um, I, I think that's a really um, important and provocative question. And um, I, I will do this again, which is to say that Marisa Fuentes' new work is on the idea of, of refuse, of, of, refuse um, of, of waste and of the way that enslaved people um, are literally uh, sort of tossed overboard in the Caribbean because they are sick or dead. Um, and, and what does the idea, how does that notion of, of, um, of, undervalued or devalued human life get kind of merged into the calculus of the slave trade. Um, I think that it's a it's a really powerful, one of the things that I find so compelling about this work is to think about how these categories that appear to be quite distinct are actually really interwoven. Um, so I really like the provocation of thinking about waste and what is wasted and what is worth being saved from waste um, in the context of the trade in human beings. Any other part? Yes, Walter. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think it's a really, really interesting question. Um, I think one of the things that I have tried to argue in this most recent book that I wrote about um, the history of St. Louis is that what we see in our world today are a set of um, efforts to extract wealth from people who have been deemed surplus from the standpoint of production. And whether that is um, payday loans or for-profit policing or various kinds of um, missed over application of economic development policy and corporate tax abatement or finally um, mass incarceration. All of those are efforts to um, to monetize people who've been left behind. And so I think to try to, to think about the, the long history of that um, would be uh, terrifically important. So it's a really, really fascinating question. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I really agree. Um, and I, I think sort of one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot is that sort of the, the uh, if, you, if you would call it like, like that, the choice for slavery as a form of, uh, uh, of, um, uh, of, as a labor relation and a form of exploitation over other forms of, um, of exploitation, of course, crucially is about the control over the labor, but it never is only about the control over the uh, over uh, over labor power itself. It also denotes absolute dispossession and control over uh, over land. And I think sort of this sort of this form of control is very amenable, allows itself very well for uh, notions of um, um, of the possibility of sort of complete sort of human dominated transformation of all the factors of production sort of they're reshaping for the needs of, uh, of profit that was of course very um, uh, um, uh, euphemistically then uh, enters uh, European um, uh, 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 political theory in the form uh, in the form of uh, improvement right so so improvement is about this potential of 
um, certain human beings to sort of completely reshape the world uh, uh, in the in the interest of uh, of profit as the ultimate sort of rational um, uh, driver for uh, for this uh, uh, for this uh, transformation and and measuring Ross and I, I I don't think you can have sort of this kind of notion or, or or I think that sort of this kind of notion of sort of what control is for of necessity uh, goes against ideas of sort of stewardship stewardship of sort of the um, factors of production that are under your control and is about their usage uh, and that the absolute sort of proof of your ability to do so is your ability not only to use but also your ability to waste. This next question comes from Fritz, who says, I recognize the historic atrocities the speakers mentioned in their individual lectures. Unfortunately, I still recognize many of those atrocities in our present society, although in many cases out of sight or out of media focus. Examples, sweatshops, child labor, gender inequality, etc. Could this research be used or is it being used already to change our present handling of suppressed or economically dependent people? I, I can start with that. I mean, I, I think that uh, one of the the things that I know hangs over or works through Jennifer's work and something that I'm sure that, that Tony and Pepin are sympathetic to and something that I try to, to model in my own work is to suggest that we cannot think about the inequality in our in our society today without thinking about its long, uh, the long fetch of its history, without thinking about the way that um, these processes and, and categories are structured into our material life to the point that they, it becomes possible to um, pretend that something else is happening. And so one of the, the things that, that I think that, that it's important for historians to do is to try to, to track out those, those connections, say a connection around the control of black women's reproduction, or say a connection around the, um, the notion of waste, right? Or a connection between the history of um, imperial techniques that are used um, to control native, you to control and exterminate Native Americans that are then used, I would argue, um, to control and, and render surplus um, in a way that is, is arguably genocidal African Americans in the history of St. Louis. So I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that. Now, how any given person manages their, their commitments in the present to their, their academic work is, is complicated. And I, um, the, the suffering and injustice in our society is acute enough that I, I think that, that the question is one that, that really bears reflecting on and that we need to be honest with ourselves as we, as we try to answer it. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate this and I hope that sort of through our work it was very clear that, that, that um, um, I think this is true for, for all of us sort of engaging with these issues, partly is it engaging with the roots of sort of injustices that are with us in the present and, 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 and also to help us thinking about how to over, uh, overcome them. I do want to also say that there is a historical moment in that enterprise where we have to sort of do justice to the historical specificity to all these different forms of oppression. And there's many reasons for this, partly because history can, I think, only help us to understand this if we do not treat this as some sort of a long list of bad things that were done to to people, but try to understand sort of the wider systemic implications of this, or the systemic reasons uh, for this. And I, I think their history can be very useful, but only if we um, um, if we understand sort of the specificities of each sort of moment in that in that history as well. But the other reason, very concretely, is that um, uh, is, is that uh, um, doing history is also about um, doing justice to those who resisted these systems of oppression and acknowledging that this resistance could be the basis for immense change uh, uh, as well. Now there's many horrendous forms of forced labor in the present and still it's very important that slavery ended 
and that slavery did not end automatically, but that it was ended, uh, 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 not in sort of the least part because of the resistance of the enslaved uh, themselves, that the Haitian Revolution is part of the history of slavery, as is what W.E.P. Du Bois called the general strike um, of, the, uh, of the enslaved in the U.S. South uh, in the course of, uh, of the American Civil War. That sort of, so, so the idea that there can be breaks as well, and that we're not just seeing a long sort of line of the same oppression, even though we're seeing many forms of continuations of this sort of, uh, of these systems that have sort of overruled, I think it, 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 uh, it's, it's also an important aspect of that. And by doing that, we can not only contribute to an understanding in the present of sort of what were the sort of the long roots and the sort of the systemic sort of reasons why we, we what, why there's still many forms of exploitation and, and, and oppression, but also I think fulfill another crucial function, which is um, uh, understanding how human beings sort of resist these things and thereby also I think um, uh, giving people sort of rays of hope that are particularly needed at this at this point in history. Well, you did, Jennifer. Sorry. No, I was just saying. I think that they uh, that Walter and Pepin answered that really well. Thank okay. you. The next question comes from Leela, who says anti-blackness has a long history here. Do you think that there's a way forward through reform or does abolition seem like the only viable way towards a nation that doesn't have anti-blackness so deeply ingrained in all systems and practices? I, I think that's, a, I, I know you can't turn it over to me, Tony, because it's such a big question. I, you know, I think that, I mean, maybe I'll just, piggyback on some of the things that Walter and Pepsin just said is that I think that what we're trying to do is is understand structures of inequity and violence, including the structural um, sort of uh, malleability, as Walter said, of anti-Blackness, um, and to see to, to as a way to both like honor what has happened, but also to um, to to re-narrativize the ways in which Black people have 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 worked to uh to to fight against that um so i don't so i think that all that the that the three of us and that historians like us who are who are deeply invested in thinking through both the histories of slavery and the afterlife of slavery um are are trying to kind of demarcate uh, uh what anti-blackness is and where where it gets um it gets overpowered. Uh, so I think that's all I can say. It feels very clumsy. And especially given that we are, again, to quote Walter, as we are just witnessed last week, this moment of um, just powerful uh, racist organizing uh, and, and, and are trying to grapple with how that happened and what we're going to do about it. Um, I, I, I find the question to be a little bigger than I can really answer. Um, not really, it's not really much. <laughs> Walter. I mean, I, I think that the, the thing that we need to begin with is by recognizing that the world that we live in is a world that has been produced out of the creativity and suffering of all past generations. I follow Kropotkin in that. And that it therefore, um, you know, we need, we need to live in a, in a world, we need to try and create a world that reflects that death. Um, and a world structured around the principles of um, from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So I, I think that that is a that's an abolitionist future that I imagine, and it's one that that's um, concerned with uh, undoing the wrongs of um, imperialism and land taking and settler colonialism, along with the wrongs of. Um, slavery and natal alienation and and all of the other wrongs. Now, um, I, I think the reason that that Jennifer, I think um, that that that's that's a lot easier to say than it is to do. And I think that that that's the the um, the the terrific humility of Jennifer's response. Um, what I can say is that. Um, and I, I wouldn't set myself up as, as an example of this, but I do see examples of it 
um, in the, the practices of, you know, different sorts of projects um, that I've seen in St. Louis or Cooperation Jackson in Jackson, Mississippi, or in the Study and Struggle program that, that Garrett Felber and Cam Kalish are, are running out of uh, the University of Mississippi um, under fire, as, as we know, and, and in countless others that, that I think we could all name. And so I really do, do think that we should try to, um, to amplify those projects and to learn from them and then try to transform our own kind of the way we, we move in the world in, in their image. Thanks, uh, Walter. I think I, if I could just say something here as a moderator that the, the question is an important one, um, but I also, and I also think that it might be uh, critical for us as we think about abolition to also the map, the ways in which abolition has intervened as a, both as a political concept and a political practice um, for people who are trying to change society in on the conditions of uh, racial slavery, uh, imperialism and, and racial capitalism. And that's to, to, to therefore to think about um, uh, how abolition becomes at this moment a, 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 both a slogan and a concept that can actually transform the notion of emancipation and freedom itself. And then, and to, to, while thinking about that, to think through, that would be the voice really, you know, the thing on abolition, his thing on abolition, democracy, which then people have taken up um, subsequently, Angela Davis and so on. And to say that abolition is not just about the end of a castro state, it's not about defunding the police or in the United States or, um, you know, if you use the United States instance, but it is really a, about a radical reorganization of society. Um, and, the, and, it's an, and, and it's not a reorganization of society in the future, but actually a reorganization of society now. And it is this business of trying to tackle what does that kind of political practice mean now that I think that one wants to think about when one thinking about abolition. Just want to intervene as the moderator because I think it's actually a really very important, it's an important question um, for us to think about as we're thinking about the work of this. This next question uh, comes from Nagam who asks, I have a sense that these efforts are very much theoretical, which is very important, but can we think of ways in which we can plan more practical steps how can this meta understanding of capitalism and slavery change reality? I think we're living in this really um, powerful moment in which, you know, the first thing that came to my mind in that question was the 1619 project, right? And this, this journalistic effort to make, a, to make an intervention that says that the history of slavery is the history, that the history of the United States is the history of slavery. Um, and to then take that project into the schools Right, so that there's a whole curriculum that's been developed that's about teaching the 1619 Project um, in American high schools, an effort that has been, uh, uh, that President Trump and um, Tom Cotton have worked to try to thwart, but which is still happening. I think that there are moments that we're seeing the, the work that good and interventionist history can do in the way that people think about um, their political lives, their lives as citizens um, in the contemporary moment. I also think a lot about uh, the connection between the histories of reproduction that both Walter and I have just talked about um, and the, the ongoing problem. I mean, we're living in a moment of a really profound um, black maternal health crisis. Maternal mortality rates are, are um, 300 times higher for African-American women in this country than for white women. And again, the, the clarion call to attend to that has been taken up, not just by scholars, but also by um, medical schools and and um, by, by physicians and by um, healthcare workers. So like, I feel like there are these moments where we see the connection between the scholarship and the kind of um, either educational, public health or other kinds of, uh, of, of applied sites of transformation. So I do get glimpses of, of possibility and you know, hope. <laughs> Anybody else want to? So can I can I come in? That yeah. I just wanted to add, sort of not on on this, uh, on this practical level, but, but, but sort of it's 
somewhat more on, on a meta level that, that um, it's not only those who criticize capitalism um, or sort of uh, uh, want to want on social reform in this uh, positive and progressive sense who acknowledge that history is important, that we are in a moment of intense battles of trying to re redefine what the history of the world and the history of, of our uh, our individual sort of the nations that we find ourselves in uh, uh, is um, that there ha uh, there are very sort of powerful sort of tendencies to present a revisionist uh, history of um, of empire uh, that sees empire basically as a benevolent sort of historical force bringing progress and uh, railroads and uh, and uh, uh, proper healthcare and, and and what have you. Uh, uh, across uh, acro across the world, there's these very strong revisionist uh, uh, um, uh, histories of the U.S. South and, and, and the Civil War. All of them, uh, very sort of immediately and almost at an intuitive level, I think, sort of in, uh, uh, that is understood by um, by the various sort of forms of right wing politicians that um, that that uh, that now are so successful. Uh, across the world, that this is um, uh, that this is pol uh, politically useful, that it helps to transform society to give people this different idea about uh, uh, the, uh, the past, and it's it's very I think noticeable that this does not only happen. Of course, it's it's obvious that this happens in the case of Trump, but the, the, that in the same way Bolsonaro in uh, in Brazil has pushed. Uh, this notion that actually the Portuguese did a lot of good for Brazil and that slavery wasn't too bad for the African uh, um, Africans uh, involved, that Modi in India has pushed his own sort of revisionist uh, um, uh, 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 vision of partition and sort of the the, the, uh, the history of uh, of uh, anti-colonial independence and the history of the, uh, of the nation, uh, the, the the far right in the um, in the Netherlands, uh, uh, actually, he's waving the flag of the DOC and uh, uh, and talks about sort of uh, themselves as a Renaissance fleet sailing into this the, the, the Dutch harbor. Um, uh, there is this sort of international culture of the far right that is about redefining our history as a, an active weapon in transforming the present. Okay, great. Thanks, Pepin. All right, um, what the final final question, Catherine? Thanks. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I'm sorry, we didn't get a chance to get to everyone's question. The last question uh, actually comes from an anonymous attendee who says, each of you gestured to structural problems in categories and fields that are siloed, segregated, and that do not speak to one another, and as a result, perpetuate damaging fictions. Most of higher education is embedded in and has implicitly or explicitly embraced a global capitalist and corporate model. Is it realistic to work within the existing systems to fundamentally and permanently change the nature of training and the questions being asked? At, because I'm the chair of an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary department, I feel like I should, I should answer this, or at least uh, try to first. Um, you know, I, I'm the chair of the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis, which is the home for the PhD program at NYU in American Studies, and which is a discipline that's really, um, that I have learned an enormous amount uh, from uh, both that and women's and gender studies, that the, the, the de-siloing of academic space through critical race studies, through interdisciplinary scholarship that is invested in thinking about structures of power has for a very long time argued against the siloing of disciplines and the siloing of, of, of academic work. Um, you know, I, I hear the, the, the critique and the question, which is a completely valid one, which is as our universities are becoming more kind of embedded in neoliberal um, economic relationships, our universities are, are becoming increasingly sites of uh, the production and reproduction of capitalism. Um, how, you know, how much work does, you know, does the Afro-American Studies Department or the American Studies Department actually do? Um, but what I will say, just speaking personally, is that the students who are coming through these departments, both graduate students and undergraduates, are doing 
such profoundly interesting and provocative and really transformative work, not just as academics, obviously many of them are doing all sorts of other things. And every time I start to feel despondent, I just like go and listen to like the honors thesis presentations in my department. And I feel this profound sense that students are taking the best of what we have to offer and doing something really new and amazing and possibly uh, revolutionary with it. Great. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, Walter and Pepin, and these are kind of final comments. Oh uh, man, I was gonna duck that one. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, first of all, the, the, these questions are so fantastic. Each, each and every one of them is so fantastic and, and challenging um, that I um, I regret that Catherine has curated them so well because it's exhausting to try to to respond to such challenging questions. Um, I, I I have so many different responses, probably most of them mutually contradictory to that question, which I think is a very good one and one that that I know um, Jennifer and Tony and Pepin wrestle with, and certainly so do I. Um, I think the one that I have adopted or tried to adopt is, and, and, and I'm not saying this is, this is any, you know, right for anybody else or even that it's morally right for me, but is to, to take a slightly less astringent position than my colleague and hero Robin Kelly does in his article on Black Study, Black Struggle in the Boston Review, um, which recognizes the importance of um, trying to work outside the conf confines of the approval structure of the university. And, and I, th I think that that is important. And I think that, you know, again, like study and struggle is an example of that. Various um, things that I, I um, know about in St. Louis are examples of the way that, that academics can work outside um, of the confines of the university. I do think that, that, university knowledge and resources can be um, redeployed in, in positive ways. And it may be that on the balance that's um, self-delusion or is um, just, just playing within the system of um, global capitalism as the question suggests. I think that, that to some degree we're all caught up in those contradictions, whether you're in the university or not, although I would agree they're particularly pronounced in the university, which does, particularly the university that I worked at, um, you know, serve to, to reproduce the existing hierarchies in the, in the society. And so the way that I approach that, and I, you know, again, I don't, I don't think this is sufficient, but is to try to um, use that to, to, to redeploy the resources of the university and the service of the people and um, to hold university knowledge accountable to eyewitness knowledge, um, but also to recognize, and you know, I, I very much appreciate Jennifer talking about the students, to recognize the, the tremendous um, talent that, that, that young people in the society have and, and the, that we have an ability to help them find their way into into worthy causes and even to, to put them in the service of um, dramatic revolutionary possibilities. And thanks, Walter Pepe. So uh, it, I think a question like that can only be a beginning, not sort of the, the end of a forum, because it, it, it asks for such a, um, a multifaceted um, uh, conversation. But, but what I I, I, I do think, and I can only agree with what the speakers before me have, have said on, on this, that, that, um, that partly sort of the reason why students um, um, are so much more attuned to this than, uh, than we as, as staff, I would say, is the immensity of sort of problems fa uh, 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 facing us and sort of the, the, uh, um, uh, the, the sort of the immediacy in which this supersedes the categories of um, uh, of academic organization. I mean, think about COVID and uh, as 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 a global sort of a global problem and how it touches on issues ranging from the sort of the hyper exploitation of uh, uh, of nature and animal life um, uh, right to sort of demeaning of 
um, uh, of, 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 of freedom and, and sort of individual freedoms in, 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 in a world sort of uh, in a world at risk. Sort of the, the, the problems sort of um, um, uh, uh, confront, that confront us are so clearly interdis uh, interdisciplinary. And the second thing that I want to say about, about that as well is that sort of the, I think the announcement of this seminar rightly starts with the shocks of Black Lives Matter. And I don't think um, uh, 10 or 100 years of academic debate could have done uh, for the discussion um, about race in the Netherlands what um, uh, a month of protest erupting in the midst of this sort of pandemic uh, uh, did for shifting national uh, uh, national uh, um, national consciousness, and that is not to belittle the contribution that academics can make, because I know many of the organizers of these uh, protests who voraciously read sort of every piece of sort of critical scholarship that they can uh, that they can uh, that they can find. But it is sort of uh, I think about a sense of uh, humility and acknowledgement that sort of um, uh, that people moving in the end sort of are more crucial to changing these systems of oppression than, than, than just sort of, than, than writing peer reviewed articles about them with all due respect. Great, uh, thank you all very much. I wanna thank uh, Catherine for curating the questions. I wanna thank all the panelists for both their initial um, remarks, which are really very important and I think um, uh, um, in, 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 uh, central to trying to, to think about some of the critical issues that face those of us who are trying to think about questions of race, capitalism, and slavery, but in a different way. Um, I want to thank the panelists as well to, um, for, for their really thoughtful answers to all the questions. And then found, and to thank the media services on Brown who managed, um, who managed this Zoom. And then to, to thank you, the audience, for staying with us uh, for this 90, um, a little bit over 90 minutes um, to, uh, to participate in this Zoom webinar event. Once again, thank you all very much. And um, from wherever you are, have a good evening, a good night, a good af afternoon, or just a good rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Take care.